you for applying for the Peer Reviewed Cancer Research Program, the PRCRP. I know it's a mouthful. Um, this is a program within the Department of Defense's medical research budget. You know, and thank you for participating in today's webinar entitled Tips for Successful PRCRP Application. My name is Lisa Peabody, and I'm part of the government relations team here at the National Brain Tumor Society. And I would like to introduce our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Kirk Tanner, who's here to welcome us. Thank you very much, Lisa. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Great. Okay. So, so thanks, Lisa, for the introduction. And first and foremost, um, I really hope that everyone in their family and your loved ones are faring okay in these really trying and unprecedented times. As Lisa mentioned, my name is uh, Kirk Tanner, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at National Brain Tumor Society. And again, I just joined Lisa and really thank you for joining us for this webinar. You know, one of National Brain Tumor Society's key pillars of activity is really to advocate for federal research dollars. And so I'm really excited then that as a result of those efforts, the De Department, of De uh, Department of Defense has made available research awards ranging from around $400,000 to a half million dollars through its peer-reviewed cancer research program, also known as the PRCRRP. Um, today's webinar is brought to you by National Brain Tumor Society, St. Baldrick's Foundation for Childhood Cancer, and the Department of Defense. We really appreciate this par partnership and collaboration. So we're also very pleased to be joined by our speaker, speaker, Dr. Donna Kimbark, who is the Programs Manager with the Peer Review Cancer Research Program. Thank you, Dr. Kimbark, for, for being here. We're also really, very happy to be joined by Sarah Milberg, the Director of Government Relations and Advocacy at St. Baldrick's Foundation. St. Baldrick's is co-hosting this webinar with us today. So before Dr. Kimbark presents, um, Sarah, do you mind telling us a little bit about St. Baldrick's and your role there? Great. Thanks, Dr. Tanner, and thank you all for joining today. It's such a pleasure to speak with all of you. Um, as Dr. Tanner mentioned, uh, St. Baldrick's is thrilled to partner with the National Brain Tumor Society today for this webinar. The research program at the Department of Defense is incredibly important uh, for pediatric cancer research in particular. Um, and as many of you know, the St. Baldrick's Foundation is the largest non-government funder of childhood cancer research. So we are thrilled again to partner um, with National Brain Tumor Society and the Department of Defense for this program today. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Lisa, it sounds like you might have to unmute because we're not hearing you. Looks like there's some uh, difficulty unmuting Lisa's line here. Oh, there you go, Lisa. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for, uh, for fixing that for me, you guys. Thanks, Dr. Tanner. Let's get some housekeeping out of the way. Um, everyone has been muted. However, if you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to type in the chat box. We are so privileged to have Dr. Kimbark with us from the Department of Defense. And so it would be best if your questions could be directed um, to her and this particular program and the webinar presentation. We will answer all these questions at the end. You should, should see a message pop up and that is where you can type your questions. Welcome Dr. Kimbark. Dr. Kimbark is such a great resource for guiding applicants on how to submit these applications. Thank you so much for sharing the, this information with us, and I'll leave the rest to you. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to your communities and um, give you ideas about the peer review cancer research programs within the congressionally directed medical research program. So let's go to my first title slide. And um, let's talk a little bit about, I'm just gonna give you a little bit um, of an idea of what I'm going to speak about today at this title slide. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about who the CDMRP is, and I'm gonna give you this, kind of like a background so that we can have a foundation of what 
uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into who the PRCRP is, what, what makes us different than some of the other cancer programs that are offered by the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. I'm going to talk to you specifically about congressional language and how you need to answer that congressional language. Then I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of the different funding opportunities that are available, giving you highlights of the important parts of those and, and introducing you to some new opportunities. After that, I'm going to go into the details of strategies for success that we've seen over the years, as well as giving you an idea of what pitfalls we've seen people uh, fall into. Now, if you come and you've listened to these before, you might recognize some of the slides, but we find that sometimes repetitive um, uh, briefings in this regard actually helps people with their grantsmanship. So let's go to the next slide. Who is the CDMRP? The CDMRP is part of the Department of Defense. We're actually part of the Army. We sit with the uh, Army Futures Command where we actually sit at Fort Detroit the Medical Research Development Command. The CDMRP is the next slide. CDMRP changes extramural research programs as directed by Congress. It's important to note that most of the programs that the CDMRP actually manages are not part of the president's budget. They're actually added to the DOD appropriation as congressional special interest programs. These congressional special interest programs are dependent on advocates and patients, just like the people that are listening in on this uh, briefing today are interested in getting more money towards pediatric cancers and neuro-oncology research. And in order to do that, they go to the Hill and they ask their Congress people for more, more research funding. When that happens, then they, uh, the congressional, um, the Congre Congress responds to that. Senate and uh, House representatives will respond to that and add uh, appropriations to the DOD appropriation. On the bottom of that slide, the CDMRP slide, you will see a number of the FY20 programs from ALS to uh, pancreatic cancer to tick-borne disease and our peer reviewed cancer research program. Congress specifies the types of programs, but the CDMRP actually determines the research strategy and how we're going to invest. Our investment strategy, we actually determine our vision. Each program determines its own vision. We really do try to fund high impact, innovative medical research. And our current director is Colonel Stephen DeLal. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that our vision is to transform healthcare for service members and the American public through innovative and impactful research. This is the uh, vision for the whole of CDMRP. How do we do that? We do that by funding groundbreaking high impact research through a method of responsibly managing collaborative research that discovers, develops, and delivers healthcare solutions for service members, veterans, and the American public. Going to the next slide, the CDMRP is really all about partnerships. In order to function, we must partner. And the first partner that we have are our are, are consumers. And those consumers demonstrate the need to Congress. And they participate at all levels. They go to Congress, they ask for these funds to be added, and then Congress, as one of our partners, then provides us with targeted guidance on how these funds should be, uh, should be delegated. The Department of Defense is part of this program. This is uh, where I sit. We oversee program management and contracting actions as well as regulatory requirements. We reach out to researchers to help us review all of the extramural applications that we get, extramural and intramural applications. The researchers act as peer reviewers and programmatic reviewers, as do the consumers. We also interact and have partnerships with other government agencies. And the reason why we have this is because of the fact that we want to ensure that we're not going to have duplicative efforts. 
we want to be able to augment existing uh, research efforts. We want to be complementary and not competitive. So we have researchers that we're trying to fund. We have researchers that are part of our peer reviewer, peer review process, and we have consumers that are part of our peer and programmatic review process as well. So let's go to the next slide and get into a little bit of the background of who the PRCRP is. Now, I've been with the peer, peer review cancer research program since it started in fiscal year 09. And if you look at the bottom of that slide, you see in fiscal year 09, we had $16 million. That's not a lot of money. We had four topic areas that year and for $16 million. As you can see, the first five years, we had uh, a small amount of money. $16 million doesn't sound small to a single person, but it is small when you talk about research and having multitudes of topic areas. We can have up to 17 topic areas we've had in, in, our, in our history. So those first five years, we had below $20 million. As we started to climb up, we, we are now up at $110 million. Well, from FY09 to FY19, we funded about $430 million and about 730 awards. And over 25 topic areas have been included in the congressional language from FY09 to FY19. I'm gonna talk specifically about this year, this FY20 year, in a moment. This FY20 year is a really important year because we've hit the threshold of $110 million. Our vision is to advance mission readiness for those in the U.S. military affected by cancer and to improve their quality of life by decreasing the burden of cancer on service members, their family, and the American public. How do we do this? Once again, successfully promoting high impact research. So let's go to the next slide. And let's talk a little bit about how the peer review cancer research program is different from all of the other programs, the cancer programs uh, that are part of this CDMRP. The congressional language tells us what topic areas we must uh, fund each year. We have 14 topic areas this year, including brain cancer, immunotherapy, uh, neuroblastoma, pediatric adolescent and young adult cancers, and pediatric brain tumors. For that pediatric adolescent and young adult cancers, pediatric is considered zero through 14. Adolescent is considered 15 through 24 years of age. And young adult is considered 25 through 39 with some demarcation with younger, younger adult and older young adult. So these are topic areas that the Congress directs us to add to the peer review cancer research program. Like I've said in the past, I'm not the one that decides these. Congress decides this uh, based on uh, actions of advocates going to the Hill and asking. Now you may have heard of the congressionally directed medical research program in the, in the past attached to things like the breast cancer research program or the prostate cancer research program. And you may mix it up thinking, well, peer review cancer research program must have breast cancer in it, must have ovarian cancer in it. No, we do not. Funds must not be used for research into breast, kidney, lung, pancreatic, prostate, ovarian, rare cancers, or melanoma. Why? All of these cancers have their own research programs. So we don't want to take our funds and spend money of our, of our money on breast cancer research, for instance, or pancreatic cancer, for instance. Now, you may recognize that pancreatic, kidney, rare cancers, and melanoma used to be part of the peer review cancer research program. They are no longer part of our program. Pancreatic is a new program this year. It has $6 million. Uh, rare Cancers is a new program this year as well. It has $7.5 million. And I want to point out that the inclusion of the Rare Cancer Research Program shall not prohibit the peer review cancer research program from funding cancers or cancer subtypes that may be rare by definition. So we all know that pediatric cancers are rare by definition. Uh, that the, because the Rare Cancer Research Program exists, does not mean that we cannot fund something in pediatric cancers. We can because of this language that Congress added. All of our 
applications must address relevance to service members and their families. So let's go to the next slide and really talk about that. What does that mean? What does the military health focus area actually mean? I think most people, when they think about military focus areas, they think about military and cancer. Everybody gets cancer. Why would we, why would we make it unique to the military? We're not saying that it's unique to the military. Everyone does get cancer. But how does a cancer diagnosis affect the military? And are the military more at risk? Those are two questions that we need to answer. So with environmental, uh, environmental or exposure risk factors may be associated with cancer. We do know that. So ionizing radiation, for instance, infectious agents, environmental carcinogens may lead to uh, development of cancer at some time in the future because of those environmental exposures that happen to the service member during deployment, for instance, or wherever they might be in the world. So that's an important part of who we are is trying to keep the military safe from these risk, risk factors. Now, the other thing is, is the service member must be mission ready at all times. And if the service member is ill with cancer and has to go to appointments, or one of their family members or support system is ill with cancer, they might have to go to appointments for them. They might actually ask for it being in an exceptional status and therefore will not be deployed. And therefore, that unit is no longer force ready. So we have to think about gaps in knowledge that may lead to issues with mission readiness. So if you want more information for this, I strongly suggest that you go to that YouTube video that's at the very bottom of that slide. Don't go to it now, but go to that YouTube video. If you can't find the, the link later on, you can always go to the CDMRP website, put that in your very favorite, um, your very favorite search engine, and click on the link and then go to the PRCRP webpage and you'll find a link to that YouTube uh, video. And that YouTube video will tell you about the PRCRP's vision about military health and cancer. It will lay it all on the line for you. It will be, oh, it's like a present, okay? So we really wanted to give it to the community so that they could understand what we were talking about with military health focus areas. Let's go to the next slide. Now here we have, I wanted to focus this slide a little bit on the neuro-oncology. Now the, here we have our adult brain cancer started in FY17 and we've been able through FY19, because FY20 hasn't started yet, uh, through FY19, we've uh, funded about $12.5 million. With neuroblastoma, it started in FY13. It's about $16.3 million. Now, neuroblastoma is one of those topic areas that we find that we get a small receipt. So really, I would really strongly, strongly suggest if you're in neuroblastoma, if you're doing research in neuroblastoma, this is a really ripe area for you to go and pick the fruit. We need more applications in neuroblastoma. Pediatric brain tumor has come and gone a couple of times. So uh, we have about $20 million there. Well, all of these three uh, need high receipts. So I really strongly recommend that you come on in, especially since the fact that we don't have melanoma as one of our topic areas anymore. We don't have pancreatic cancer as one of our topic areas anymore. We have $110 million and a lot of our large topic areas are now gone. So it's really an open field for adult brain cancer, neuroblastoma, pediatric brain cancer, and pediatric uh, adolescent and young adult cancers to come in. Uh, just to give you a hint about that, pediatric cancer, adolescent, and young adult cancers, we funded about $16.3 million with, with, that, uh, with that one as well. And that's about, uh, when we add that to our 49.1 million there, we get about 65.3 million. And that's about 15% of our portfolio is now sitting in neuro-oncology and pediatric cancers. So we do want to increase that. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing this outreach. I really want to increase the amount of pediatric cancers and neuro-oncology in our portfolio. So let's go forward and look at our program cycle on the next slide. 
When we look at our program cycle, where we are right now is we've already had our congressional appropriation of $110 million. We've already had our investment strategy meeting. We have released our funding opportunities. It is now time for you to come in, jump in, and apply. So I'm going to be talking about that application process. I'm going to be talking about those funding opportunities. And then when we go around to about the 4 o'clock, Part of that uh, circle, that first circle there, I'm going to talk about the peer and programmatic review and how you can tailor your application to answer what the peer and programmatic reviewers are going to be looking at. So let's go to the next slide. When we go to the next slide, the first thing that you actually really want to know, um, and I've kind of put it off for a little bit here, but what you really want to know is where can I find these funding opportunities? Like I said, go to your favorite search engine, put in CDMRP. Click on that link and you can go to funding opportunities right at the top or on the side and you can go right to our funding opportunities. You can also go to eBRAP, which is our portal for pre-applications and verification. You could put in eBRAP into your favorite uh, search engines as well and go ahead and click on that tab that says funding opportunities. Now, if all else fails and you can't remember any of that, go to our grants.gov, go to grants.gov which is not part of the DOD, but it's a federal-wide uh, system. So grants.gov, our CFDA number is 12.420. So you put in 12, just write 12.420, and you don't need to write any of those other ones down. I just put that into grants.gov, and you'll be able to find our next, uh, all, of our, uh, all of our opportunities for the CDMRP. So let's go to the next slide. I want to talk to you about the Peer Review Cancer Research Program. I want to give you an idea of how to apply, but what are you applying for, okay? There are two funding opportunities, the IDEA Award and the Impact Award, that are kind of married together. They're two ends of the spectrum. The IDEA Award is really about innovative, new ideas. You have a little bit of preliminary data. Maybe you don't have any preliminary data, but you have this really crazy idea. This is where the IDEA Award comes in. We're really looking for supporting high-risk, high high-gain research, supporting innovative research. All researchers with a faculty-level appointment are eligible, and we're really emphasizing innovation. Now, for the IDEA Award, we do require that you put in a one-page pre-proposal, okay? And that one-page pre-proposal is part of your pre-application process. So you'll go into eBRAP and you'll put in your one-page pre-proposal that in the program announcement, we outline everything that you have to add into that pre-proposal. It's only one page, though. You, will do, you do need an invitation to submit. So that pre-proposal will, will be reviewed by our programmatic panel and then they will make the recommendation about whether or not you can be um, invited to submit a full application. Then you will submit your full application and it will be reviewed. Preliminary data is not required here. So if you do put in preliminary data, make sure it is strong. Because if it is not strong preliminary data, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Now don't make, make sure at the same time, so this is a balancing act. Make sure at the same time that it's not too mature. Because if it's too mature, you might be doing the next incremental step, and the next incremental step is not what we're looking for under the IDEA Award. So the direct costs here are 500K for up to three years. So let's look at the Impact Award. The Impact Award is the next step along the way of maturation as far as uh, research is concerned. Here we're looking at assistant professors or above. We're supporting research projects and ideas that are specifically focused on critical scientific and clinical cancer issues with a potential to make a major impact on one of the FY20 PRCRP topic areas. We're really looking for mature science here. So we're going to require preliminary data, okay? Preliminary data is required. Now we will require a two-page pre-proposal. That two-page pre-proposal, we outline what you need to put on that pre-proposal, what you have to answer to that pre-proposal. And the programmatic reviewers will use that and, and give us a recommendation to invite a full proposal. Clinical trial support is allowed. So if you do want to apply for a clinical trial uh, award in this capacity, you can. You don't have to, but you can. 
a preliminary data, as I said, is required, and it's $1 million over three years. So let's go to the next uh, slide. Now, all of the rest of the ones I'm going to talk about are what we call a letter of intent. So that pre-application process is simply a letter of intent. What does that mean? A letter of intent means that you're going to write a letter that's going to say, I'm going to apply to the Behavioral Health Science Award under neuroblastoma, period. That's all. It's not going to be reviewed. It's for administrative purposes only, okay? You do not need to write a whole long letter here. So there are, right now we're looking at two different award mechanisms that use that letter of intent as a pre-application process for the Translational Team Science Award. We've used this multiple times in the past, this funding opportunity. This is where assistant professors or above are eligible. We're going to put together two to three partners. And putting together those two to three partners, each one of them will have an intellectual stake in the project and what's going to come out of it. One of them is not just applying samples. They are all working together, putting the proposal together, as well as the project itself. Here we're supporting correlative studies associated with an ongoing or completed trial. Now I want to point out, if you're just going into patient files and doing a meta-analysis on patient files, that is not considered a clinical trial. A clinical trial is where you're testing an intervention, not where you're looking at pa uh, uh, patient files. So keep that in mind. You have to be associated with a clinical trial. This is not for high throughput. Areas of emphasis are encouraged but not required. Interventions to improve quality of life are important, and cancer prevention or early detection are important for some of our topic areas. Clinical trial support is allowed, but remember we're really emphasizing doing those correlative studies from samples and images and so on that you might have gotten from a clinical trial but are now uh, want to do an analysis on. New for the FY20 year, we are doing letter of intent here. We are not doing a pre-proposal. So there's no invitation is needed to apply for a full application for this one. Preliminary data is required, and you have 1.5 million amongst their partners over four years. Now, the Behavioral Health Science Award is brand new for fiscal year 20. And um, what we're looking at here is for individual investigators with a faculty level appointment or equivalent. We're really supporting innovative research in the area of prevention, survivorship, quality of life, and psychosocial effects related to cancer. We all know that the effects of cancer can be a hardship, not only from the treatment and the side effects and so on, but long term. How does it affect long-term? How does it affect the quality of life? When we're talking about children with cancer, how does it affect their long-term? And they grow into adulthood, how does it change how they react and, and, and interact? So we're looking at the psychosocial effects related to cancer here through all of the different stages of survivorship from acute to extended to permanent. We will support pilot clinical trials here uh, but only pilot clinical trials. A letter of intent is required. No invitation is needed. And preliminary data will be required for applications proposing that pilot clinical trial. The direct costs are one million over four years. We're very excited about this award mechanism. Spread the word. We need more people looking at survivorship area, uh, the survivorship area. We really want people, and we really uh, want people to uh, to apply to this and we really want people to understand that this is an important part of the peer review cancer research program. So let's go to the next slide. This is another one of our very new award mechanisms, the Fiscal Year 20 Virtual Cancer Center Director Award. Now this is a letter of intent is required. You don't have to write up a big, uh, big, big um, pre-proposal. What we're really, this is an extraordinary opportunity for that unique individual that is established investigator and a director and a uh, deputy director coming together to share their vision. This is a visionary uh, person, to share their vision of the future. 
We all know about cancer centers from MD Anderson to Roswell Park and so on. They have cancer centers, okay? But imagine a virtual cancer center that is focused uh, on the early career investigators because that deputy director and that director have a vision for how the next generation of cancer researchers should tackle cancer. So what if we brought in uh, scholars, the early career investigators, those scholars can come in, they'll be mentored, and they'll be uh, uh, directed and guided along the way to uh, a career that could move the, could, the entire field forward. So we're looking for independent career investigators across the spectrum of cancer. So we'll have somebody from neuroblastoma. We'll have, some, we'll have a, uh, a scholar from neuroblastoma. We'll have a scholar from pediatric brain tumor. We'll have a couple of scholars maybe, maybe from cancer in children, adolescents, and young adults, and maybe somebody from bladder cancer, okay? So a whole different number of, of scholars all together here learning from one another. Wouldn't that be in, um, an important way to look and, and envision the next generation of cancer researchers? Because think of it. Melanoma, as an example, melanoma is far ahead of many of our cancers in immunotherapy. They're far, far ahead. In fact, they're going into the next two and thir third stage of, of immunotherapy, while a lot of the other cancers are still far behind. So what if we learned from one another rather than going in stovepipes, having our scholars always, the early career investigators, always in these stovepipes? So what we want to do is we want to bring, we want to converge the fields together and look at the commonalities of cancer and discover cogent solutions through an interactive network. Now the director will be, uh, the funds will be for the development of the virtual cancer center, uh, workshops, meetings, the director and deputy director's salary, administrative costs. It's a 1.25 million for up to four years. Now the letter of intent, all you have to do is state that you're going to apply. No invitation is needed for a full application. Scholars will apply on a separate funding opportunity, not this one. So let's go to the next slide. And this slide just encompasses exactly what I was talking about before. And I just like to put this out there to give an idea that the deputy director and the director are gonna get a lot from this as well. They're gonna start interacting with these scholars. They're gonna start new collaborations with these scholars. They're gonna hold annual meetings. They're gonna have an advisory board of those uh, career uh, guides for the scholars. And there is going to be an interactive network, not just for the scholars, but for the director and the deputy director too. So we're really nurturing a new way to do cancer research. Let's go to the next slide. And this slide is the Career Development Award, and this is where the scholar for the Virtual Cancer Center can apply. I will talk about both of these options, both the fellow and the Virtual Cancer Center Scholar. The Virtual Cancer Center Scholar must be an independent investigator at or above the level of assistant professor or instructor, and within seven years of completion of their terminal degree. Now, there is a caveat here. If you are, um, are like a clinical fellow, or a medical resident, or, um, or have, have time off for me family medical leave, then those do not count against your seven years uh, for completion. The career guide must be at an associate level professor. I support scholars in a unique interactive virtual cancer center focused on fostering the next generation of independent investigators. Now I do want to point out a little bit of the, a point here is that for the scholars, we do ask you to be tenure tracked. Now it has been brought up to me that in some aspects, physician scientists and clinicians might not be on tenure track because of your institute. All you need to do then is in the letter of eligibility that your department chair or dean will write, they have to justify why you're not on tenure track, that that is an institutional policy, and that will be fine. The candidate should demonstrate an outstanding level of productivity and potential, and this is really gonna provide for a really huge opportunity here, but it does uh, 
the scholar is responsible for being part of this and they do have to acknowledge that. A letter of intent is required and this will be 800K over four years. Now for the fellow option, the fellow option has the same uh, independent investigator at or above the level of assistant professor or instructor. They do not have to be a tenure track and within seven years after completion of their terminal degree. The career guide is an associate professor. This supports impactful research. Preliminary data is not required. And it's 400K over three years. At this point, the fellows are not part of the Virtual Cancer Center. So that's important to note that the fellows will not be part of this Virtual Cancer Center. That doesn't mean that sometime in the future, uh, opportunities will not open up for them. But what we do want to say for these uh, fellows is that normally if you're younger in your career, earlier in your career, this is where you should be um, coming in. So let's go to the next slide. And the next slide is those funding opportunity documents that are offered by the CDMRP. You see two documents that you should be looking at, the program announcement and the general application instructions. Now the program announcement that is shown on slide 18 is a uh, program announcement for the Virtual Cancer Center Director Award. And you will see in the uh, lower box, the large lower red box on the left hand side is the milestones, the submission dates and so on for the Virtual Cancer Center Director. This is just for the Virtual Cancer Center Director, it doesn't mean it's for everybody. Now the overview of the funding opportunity, the program announcement itself will have your award intent, it will have a description of, of the project narrative. It will have the attachments that you have to have in there. It will also have, have the funding restrictions as well as the peer and programmatic review criteria. And I'll talk about all of that as we go. Now the general application instructions really gets into the minutia of step-by-step going through things and how to apply through EBRAP for your pre-application and through extramural organizations, how to apply through grants.gov. So let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the submission process. Okay, the submission process is a three-step process here. Here um, you have your first step is that you're going to go ahead as a uh, principal investigator and you're going to submit your pre-application in EBRAP. At the pre-application stage, you do not need your business official to validate, okay? So all you really need to do is you need to write up your pre-proposal for the IDEA award or the impact award, or write up your letter of intent, one or the other, depending. And then you can submit. Make sure to identify who that business official is going to be in the pre-application process in EBRAP. The second step, after you've been either invited or you're ready to submit your full application with a letter of intent. When you submit your full application, your business official should be the one submitting and, and, and approving that uh, submission. Extramural will come in through grants.gov. Intramural will come in through um, EBRAP. Now, what is intramural? Intramural is only DOD. If you're from the NCI, if you're from another government agency, you come in through ex the extramural. You do not come through intramural. And then the third step is after your full application has been submitted through grants.gov, you can go in through EBRAP and verify the pieces and parts of your application are correct. So let's go to the next slide. And here on slide 20, we're looking at the difference, once again, for pre-proposal and letter of intent. I'm not gonna go in depth into the slide. This is just to remind you that the IDEA award and the impact award will require a pre-proposal, pre one to two page pre-proposal specified in the program announcement, what you have to put in that pre-proposal and specified in the program announcement, how the programmatic panel will review each one of those with a criteria. The pre-proposal will be reviewed, as I said, by the programmatic panel and an invitation is required. So if you don't get an invitation, you are not allowed to apply to the IDEA Award and the Impact Award. For the uh, Virtual Cancer Center Award, the Behavioral Health Science Award, the Translational Team Science Award, and the Career Development Award, these are all letter of intent and used for only administrative purposes and are not reviewed. Let's go to the next slide. 
Now here we get into the nitty gritty of how your application is going to be reviewed. And this is where we really get into the strategies for success and what you should be paying attention to. The CDMRP uses a two-tiered review process that includes peer review and programmatic review. Peer review is really the evaluation, the scientific evaluation and the impact evaluation and programmatic review is where we determine whether or not something should be uh, funded or not funded. So let's go into detail on the next slide on 22. We'll see how the evaluation process actually works for peer review. Here, there's a technical assessment based on the ideal application. We're looking at a gold standard and there's a criteria-based evaluation of the entire application. How do you know what that criteria is? It's published in the program announcement. We give you the cheat sheet in the program announcement. So it should be fairly easy for you to make sure that you're answering all of that. And I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. Now the peer reviewers are panels that comprise of scientific clinicians and consumer reviewers. Consumer reviewers have an equal voice on our panel. There are no standing panels, and uh, reviewers are recruited based on their expertise. The identity should remain unknown, and there should not be contact between uh, applicants and reviewers. What will come out of the peer review is what we call the summary statement. The summary statement will have uh, scores, and it will also have strengths and weaknesses for each one of the criteria. How do you make sure that your strengths are really, really strong? powerful and how do you make sure that your uh, weaknesses don't exist at all let's go to the next slide here is an example of peer review criteria this is from the impact award so when you look at this it says uh, very at the top it says to determine technical merit all applications will be evaluated according to the following scored criteria which are of equal importance okay so now we go through each one of these uh, these lines each one of these bullets. And we tell the peer reviewers, answer each one of those bullets. And when they go through how well the rationale is described for the study in terms of clinical research gap or patient outcome gap, why are we evaluating that for this award mechanism? Because that's exactly what we asked you for under the project narrative. We could be asking you anything that is in the application package is translated to evaluative sentences in peer review. For instance, this is probably written in the, in the project narrative as describe the rationale for the study in terms of clinical research gap or patient outcome gap. And then I just flipped it around and I wrote how well the rationale is described. So if you answer each and every one of these, there are no weaknesses to give, okay, unless you don't answer them well. So make sure you answer them and you answer them well. For instance, on about the second to last bullet there, it says how well the application acknowledges potential problems and potential pitfalls and addresses alternative approaches. One of the things we notice here is that people ignore that one or they end up uh, addressing the potential problems and they don't give any alternative approaches or the alternative approaches really don't go with the goal or the, or the hypothesis. Or the other thing is, is that they have a tendency to take their specific aims and interrelate them. Don't interrelate your aims. If the first aim and everything on the everything else uh, after the first aim is dependent on that first aim being successful, do not do that. Okay, because the first aim falls down, nobody's going to want to fund the rest. So keep that in mind as you go through these peer review criteria. That this is your cheat sheet. As you write to the project narrative, you should have these open. As you write to the innovation statement, you should have this open. As you write to the impact statement, you should have the impact scoring criteria open. Keep that all in mind. So the next tier of review, after we get our summary statements with all the strengths and weaknesses, we go to programmatic review. At programmatic review, we have our panel, which I will introduce you to in a moment. And they will start comparing and contrasting because peer review is not allowed to compare. They're, they compare to an idealized uh, application. They don't compare to one another. In fact, they tell them not to. What the programmatic review panel members are actually doing is looking at how strong the scientific merit is, adherence to the award mechanism, 
the potential for impact, uh, relevance to the portfolio composition. It's really important for us with a multi-topic area. We want to fund every single topic area, even a topic area that has a low receipt, like neuroblastoma has a very low receipt, but we make sure that we fund it every single year because we want portfolio balance. So programmatic panel members are comprised of consumers, clinicians, researchers, and military members. We have active duty oncologists on ours. So let's go to the next slide. And you'll see on slide 25 our programmatic panel members. One of the most important parts of our programmatic panel, and this slide is the stuff that's in red. Do not include any of the programmatic panel members in your application. I'm going to say that one more time. Do not include any of the programmatic panel members in your application. If you can't remember them all here, they are on the PRCRP website under the CDMRP website. They're on our page. Just click on them, look at them, and you'll know not to include them. If you're including them, they are considered being a conflict of interest and you are no longer compliant, and I have to remove your application from consideration. Now, up above that, what you see is how the programmatic panel actually reviews, for instance, the impact award. They're going to look at the rating and evaluations of the peer reviewers, but then they have to really slice and dice and see which ones are the best. They're going to look at the adherence to the award mechanism. Is this really too early along the way? It should have been an idea award. Uh, don't let the money, you know, dictate, oh, I want to fund, I, I want to apply to a 500K or a million K. I'm going to apply to the million K. Maybe you're not ready for the million K, of the million, uh, million K. Uh, maybe you're not ready for the million dollar one. You might be ready for the 500K one instead. So really take a look at how mature your science is and whether it fits the intent. Portfolio balance is always one of the things we take a look at. And military health. Military health is really a strong, important part of the peer review cancer research program's programmatic review. If we find that you're phoning it in and just repeating what the YouTube video said or what it says in the program announcements, I'm going to tell you, you are not going to get funded. They don't like that, okay? They just don't like it. So pay attention to that. Do a little bit of homework. Be a little bit creative on your military health focus area, and that might bump you up to being funded. So let's go to the next slide. This is just basic strategies for success. Remember to pay attention to what the specific guidance is in the announcement. If we're asking for certain things, it's important for you to follow the rules, okay? It's important for you to clearly state the impact. CDMRP is all about getting to patient outcomes, making patient outcomes better. The only way we could do that is by having an impact. So you should propose solutions for problems. You should have a goal that would clearly represent an impact on a pa the patient community. If the award mechanism, such as the IDEA Award, is about innovation, you should be filling a gap. You should be having novel approaches or, um, you know, not doing, for instance, the next incremental step. The next incremental step is not considered innovative. Going from one cancer to another in the same model system, doing the same thing, it's not considered innovative. The feasibility of the uh, project is very important as well. So let's, when you put your team together and you're thinking, oh, I really need to have this powered, I need to have a good statistical plan here, bring that biostatistician in on the ground floor. Don't make that biostatistician jump from the 20th floor after your, you know, your 30 minutes until you're going to uh, submit this uh, application into grants.gov. Don't do that. That is not going to help you. So you should put the appropriate expertise, put the appropriate statistical plan in place, and demonstrate the availability and access to your resources and study populations. So some other strategies for success on slide 27, you will see that include and allow uh, the time is adequate for the project. Remember, you have to have regulatory review and so on. So keep that in mind. Coordinate with your different institutes if it's multi-institutional. 
and understand that you'll have different organizations and collaborations will have different uh, requirements that you have to address. Your grantsmanship is really an important part, believe it or not. Uh, when I hear a peer reviewer saying, this was a pleasure to read, means a huge difference in how that's going to be scored. It's really important. If you throw in as much jargon as you possibly can to show that you really know the field, yes, you might be the genius in the field, but nobody understands what you're saying. So let's be clear about it. Let's really communicate effectively. Remember your audience is the peer and programmatic reviewers. Look at their criteria, both at the pre-application process uh, step and the, and the full application step. Review the application documents carefully before submission to make sure that you put everything in there. And be compliant. Don't break the rules for the deadline. So let's go so for the next slide where we're looking at the pitfalls to avoid in, in the application process. As I said, do not include any programmatic panel members for the program and fiscal year to which you're applying. That's just a, a huge mistake and it's a simple one to avoid. Also, when you convert your uh, application into a PDF, make sure that the page limits stay the same. Okay, you have, to, you have to stay within the page limits and very often when you convert, when you're creating a PDF version, sometimes it adds a couple of pages or adds a couple of lines to another page. And now you're over the page limit and now we have to get rid of you. Unfortunately, my grants officer will make, me, make you non-compliant. Do not miss the, uh, the submission deadlines. It's important not to miss the submission deadlines. Remember, validation can take up to 72 hours in grants.gov. System to system submissions are sometimes problematic. So remember using that workspace is, is a godsend. Application verification and EBRAP is possible before the deadline, uh, before, the, before that deadline, as long as you get your application in beforehand. And um, submit the correct project narrative and budget before the application deadline because you cannot uh, modify these during the verification period, which is after the deadline in EBRAP. So going to the next slide, this is just a summary of the funding opportunities that are available. Please take a look at, one, at them to see which one is most appropriate for you to take a look at and to apply to. Don't let the money be your guide. What your uh, hypothesis and goals are should be your guide. So let's go to the next slide. These are your timelines. Okay, for the IDEA Award and the Impact Award, you do have a pre-proposal that you have to submit. And that pre-proposal is due on the 14th of May. So you need to write that now, since a lot of us are sitting at home, it's time to write for uh, pre-proposals. So write your IDEA Award or your Impact Award now and pu publish, pu put it in to EBRAP by the 14th of May. You'll get an invitation to submit by the 16th of June. Your full application will be due on the 27th of August. And the end of the verification period where you can look at your pieces and parts of your application in EBRAP is due as on the 3rd of September. Peer review will be in November and programmatic review will be in February. This is for the IDEA award and impact award only. For the letter of intent mechanisms, which are all the other mechanisms, your letter of intent, I'm going to apply, is due on the 30th of July. Now, all this time between now and the 27th of August, you can be working on your full application because you do not need an invitation to apply. So the 27th of August is when your full application is due. The end of the verification period that you can look at your pieces and parts in EBRAP is the 3rd of September. Peer review will be in October and November, and programmatic review will be in December and February. So if we go to the next slide, these are some of the different uh, URLs that you might want to uh, jot down. We have a URL for PRCRP for uh, CDMRP overviews. It's a video of uh, the CDMRP. And also we have a webinar series which will repeat some of what I told, told you here, but in more depth. So you'll get more depth of how to read through those funding opportunity uh, program announcements. And um, going to the next slide, I want to thank you for your attention. 
and uh, thank the uh, National Brain Tumor Society and St. Baldrick's Foundation for this opportunity. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Donna. That was really spectacular. I'm sure that um, research has picked up lots of great tips to make sure that you can have success. Um, as a reminder, if you wanted to pose a question, you can do that now in the chat box. We want to direct our questions to specifically to Dr. Kim Bark in this webinar. And my colleague, Lini, is going to read those questions for us. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so the first question we um, received was, um, sorry, I'm just going to move to the next one. So the first question was, can one apply for both the IDEA and IMPACT Award? Yes, you can apply for uh, the IDEA Award and the IMPACT Award. You should just apply with different projects. You can only apply once, though, for the IDEA Award and the IMPACT Award. Okay, and so also for the IMPACT Award, how much clinical trial support info is required? Is it absolutely mandatory? For the, for which award mechanism? The IMPACT Award. For the IMPACT Award, no, you do not have to do a clinical trial at all for that one. That is not, that is not required. It is, I just um, put there, if you want to do a clinical trial, it's an option. Okay, great. Another question came in, um, can research faculty, so for example, research associate professor, apply for Im the IMPACT Award? Research associate professor, um, that, that I would think that you would have to be an independent. If you are independent and your uh, institute allows you to apply, you can, but you have to be independent and show that you are able to do the work. Okay, great. And if anyone has follow ups to these, um, feel free to chat them in the chat box. Uh, this next one is about which program would be most appropriate. So where does survivorship research that is focused on lessening physical late effects such as cardiac toxicity. So would that be the idea slash impact or um, versus the behavioral science. I would think it would be best under the behavioral science. If you take a look at the, uh, the award intent, I think we actually do talk about long-term sequelae like cardiac. I'm not 100% certain, but we did talk about that. So yes, it's patient outcome. Okay. So have behavioral health, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, for the TTSA program, it says at least one military or VA investigator is strongly encouraged to be included as an partner in the research offering both intellectual investment and research effort. Is this practically a requirement? Should one apply if, if they do not have a VA collaborator? It's not a requirement, it's just encouraged. If you have someone that is a VA, a VA person or a military or a young investigator and you want to include them, uh, it does give you a little bit of like a gold star but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be funded just because of that, but it does give you a little edge. Okay, great, that's helpful, thank you. Um, one more was, what is the small business PI eligibility criteria for PRCRP applications? Um, the small business is, we've had small businesses apply uh, previously. We've had small businesses apply for many of the different programs. I would think that probably the only one that might not be appropriate would be probably the Scholar Award and the uh, Virtual Cancer Center Director Award. Probably those would not be appropriate, but the other ones would be. Okay, great. So that looks like the end of the questions, uh, in case, unless anyone has any more. Um, we'll give one last shot here. I do want to make a point that sometimes people ask me this question and I didn't cover it in my briefing is that we do allow in international applications. So that is allowed and we do fund internationally. We just don't fund, um, we don't fund countries that are uh, sponsors of state terrorism. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kim Bark, and thank you, Dr. Tanner, and thank you, Sarah Milberg, and thanks everyone for joining. We really appreciate your time today. This webinar will be available through a recording, and we will share that link in the coming days.
In the meantime, stay safe and thank you for your participation. Thank you.